بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته respected viewers listeners joining us here on the Islamic Literary Society I'd like to give you a warm warm welcome once again to another fantastic interview and this one I promise you you definitely do not want to miss I'm your host for the evening my name is Junaid Da and we are going to be bringing to you a very very exclusive interview here at the Islamic Literary Society which was founded in 2019. We are trying our very best here to encourage the youngsters and encourage our audience to turn back to literature, to have a look at the books, have a look at the history, have a look at the heritage, see what is written and see how we can benefit from what we have uh, in these great books and these authors and these great intellectuals around the world that have got so much to offer us, subhanAllah. So this is our, uh, our objective. We do this through a number of different ways. We have book clubs, alhamdulillah. We have different opportunities, book reviews. You will see that on our website. So I encourage you to go to our website. So you have islamicliteracysociety.com. So please do go there and please do uh, enjoy the benefits of that website. And most importantly, and I would say probably which is most enjoyable as well, are these interviews. So we try to revive the love of books and the love of our scholars and our writers through direct interviews with the authors of these amazing, amazing books. With me today, we have a very, very special guest, subhanAllah. And, you know, when the guest was introduced to myself and I read through the guest's CV and the achievements and accomplishments, I was, wallahi, I, I don't know how to describe, but humbled um, shy and at the same time very proud to have such a person in our midst subhanallah and yet we are unaware so what we have or who do we have with us today we have with us a professor Abdul Rahim uh, Kidawi before I bring him onto the screen I want to just very briefly read something from his CV so I'm going to turn my face that way so you can see uh, what subhanallah this professor has achieved mashallah he is a uh, he has an MA and MPhil PhD in Islamic literature uh, from the University of Aligarh uh, Muslim University, that's in India. Likewise, the professor with us today has another PhD, subhanAllah, in English as well, English literature. And this comes from the University of Leicester, UK, into, in 1993. And mashallah, he has many other awards, scholarships, and he has so many different books, subhanAllah, just going through the amount of books that the professor has written, right down, subhanAllah, 13, 14, on his CV, there's a humble 27 different books on Islamic uh, subjects, on, on English literature, subhanAllah. And when it comes to lectures as well, okay, when it comes to lectures, subhanAllah, he has div delivered lectures on Orientalism at different universities uh, in Oxford, Sunderland, and Leicester, various universities. Uh, I, I mean, the list goes on and on. International speaker, well-renowned speaker. Um, he has so much experience in so many different subjects, so many different fields. And not just that, but if we look at his articles, mashallah, he has written so many different articles, new perspectives in non-native literature and English. Um, subhanAllah, what else? There, there, there is so much there. And he has upcoming books as well upcoming uh, articles so there's so much to benefit from this you know subhanallah very humble i'm give, i'm really summarizing his achievements so let me begin by bringing our speaker onto the screen and say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh abdur rahim how are you today wa alaikum assalam jazakallah for your very kind words which i hardly deserve but uh, and thank you for giving me this excellent opportunity and it is, uh, since it coincides with such an auspicious uh, day, that's uh, Eid, Yomi Eid Milad Nabi. And we are going to discuss Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I think uh, to begin with, let us all recite the root. That's the best way of uh, remembrance and zikr. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad wa salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid Allahumma ala ala Muhammad wa baraka ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid and uh, all authentic hadith they tell that this is the best zikr remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of our patriarch Deen Hanif that's Prophet Ibrahim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and of course, Prophet Muhammad and his Ashab and his Al. Right. So, uh, Sheikh, we are going to be primarily focusing 
um, on the book, which is Images of the Prophet Muhammad in English Literature. Um, so just Probably. before before we go into the book itself, I, I just wanted to get just a, a quick uh, quick question. SubhanAllah, what motivates you, SubhanAllah, to, to do so much hard work and so many achievements? What pushes you to, to, to this achievement? Actually, my grandfather was um, also a scholar of Islamic studies. I'm only a humble student. He was a scholar. His name was Abdul Majid Dariyabadi. And in 1940s, he wrote two independent commentaries tafasir on the Quran, one in Urdu and one in English. And the English one that has been reprinted by Islamic Foundation Leicester, and it is very helpful for uh, those who are exposed to the West. Because at that time, uh, colonial period, 1910, 20, 30, so people were just uh, mesmerized by the Western culture and civilization. And since he was a BA, he had done BA philosophy. So he knew the oriental mindset. So you might say that that was the inspiration. And that's what uh, attracted me to study the field further. MashaAllah, beautiful uh, following in the footsteps of your father, alhamdulillah. Uh, uh, Professor, in your book itself, Images of the Prophet Muhammad in English literature, could I ask you to just give us a very quick summary of what, what does it mean? What is this book? What's the objective in, in writing this book? Right, as a student of English literature, I found uh, some passing references to English literature from the Prophet and uh, mostly highly negative but uh, let me clarify that the purpose of this study is not to uh, this aggravate this uh, mutual uh, confrontation or to arouse any kind of hatred let us try to understand why was it so what prompted them to misperceive misconstrue the prophets personality and his achievements and what were the factors behind it and now how gradually things have been changing. So that's why I have traced the whole evolution of this image of the prophet in English literary writings right from the beginning to our times to uh, this 21st century. Okay, and uh, Sheikh, I've, I've gone through most of your book and uh, I found it very, very insightful, especially with the current events and everything. It's a really, really powerful book. Uh, Sheikh, you start off with uh, uh, your very first chapter. You take, it, you take us on a journey and the journey begins right from the medieval period where you look at how the Prophet yes. was depicted in this time frame. My very first question was, why did you go so far back? You see, everything has its own uh, genesis, uh, its context, our background. So, so is the case with the image of the prophet in English literature or in Western culture. And uh, you have to dig into the past that uh, why they thought so or what made them think along those lines. So in the case of the prophet, uh, there are two or three things uh, which... Uh, I will share with you. First of all, very unfortunate but historical truth, the two major religions, that's Christianity and Islam, they were introduced to each other on the battleground. Okay. Both literally mm -hmm. and metaphorically. There is no cultural exchange. There is no neighborly relation. There is no community life between the two. One fine morning, the Christians who were having a field day from 3rd century onwards, entire Africa, Asia, under their control, unchallenged, unquestioned. And one fine morning, Islam knocking at their doors, mm. up to France, mm. Spain gone, Sicily gone, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, everything gone. And up to France, you know that in 8th century, there was a battle at Quietress, uh, 11th century. Had Muslims uh, won by any chance that yeah. battle, then France and then, then England. Right, that was something totally unexpected. It uh, 
took them by uh, surprise is a very light word for that mm. this is this is one point and that's why the as a reaction there were two sides and for 300 years they were just fighting and fighting and again both literally and metaphorically they are after each other's blood isn't it they are enemies yeah, yeah. one more uh, background point we should keep in mind and uh, uh, we should give some allowance for that christians they have absolutely no idea of prophethood or revelation okay for us it is a matter of belief yes one of the basic articles of faith yes but for them jesus is all jesus is revelation jesus is god jesus is everything so the idea of prophet a human being being the chosen one by god is unthinkable for them they, they don't have any such tradition yes same holds the quran they, they don't consider the bible to be the divine or the word of god in the sense we take the quran to be they, okay. they acknowledge that it was done by the disciples and done in second century 150 years after prophet jesus so that's why they found it beyond their comprehension that they could be somebody who could receive divine message and spread that so that is why they have picked up the prophet okay. one more reason for islam that two basic sources one is the quran and the other is the prophet tira the quran being in arabic and we are talking about 8 9 10th 11th century hardly anyone in in the west knows any arabic it was only in 12th century that the chairs of arabic were established in oxford and cambridge so they cannot have access to the quran the only thing left to discredit islam is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life okay and he was a human being and a human being again for them with a difference because this god man had wives had family for battles was head of his state yeah. they found it they were just beyond their comprehension how could it all be so they found an easy target soft target in the prophet and they criticized they demonized they discredited him the point was that if you discredit islam or the prophet then the remaining people in asia in europe elsewhere they will not be attracted any further to islam because islam was spreading phenomenally so to stem the spread of islam they to get as a kind of defensive mechanism to discredit it that's mm-hmm. why from day one up to 19th century all the time the prophet is projected as imposter mm. false fake uh, we feel very much offended by it but this is what their perception or belief system is because they don't have any tradition of prophet they take islam as a challenge to their hegemony so all which all the ingredients of an enemy they saw in islam it was not just belief system it was money and power as well okay. look at the look at the legendary byzantine empire one fine morning gone isn't it yes constantin constantin pole which is like makkah mazama in sanctity to in eastern christianity fell to muslims mm. the centuries of legacy is gone so they took islam and the prophet as enemy number 1 and they 
refuse to recognize Islam as a religion. And uh, also, Professor, uh, refusing to accept it as a religion. Um, if I can ask you, at the same time, the medieval period, while the you know the books and the literature and the clergymen and so on and so forth were portraying the Prophet Sallam in this way, uh, what was also taking place politically, like with regards to the Crusades? Was that uh, was that also taking place? Exactly. Yes, exactly. That was the the, the two things who were going on parallel to each other. And who said that at another level that was again to settle political scores and for that all the Europeans and just imagine and you have to give some credit to their zeal and fervor all the way from Europe, all the way crossing through Turkey, Syria and then reaching this Jerusalem. So <clears throat> it was a matter of life and death for, for them and they whipped up this religious emotions. And that's why such bitterness, such negative portrayal of Islam and Muslims. So this is very unfortunate, but this is what part of history is. And that left it, its imprint on the writers, on poets, on the novelists. And that's how a negative image of Islam and Muslims that was developed and it persists even to this day. Yeah. Sheikh, would it be fair for me to say, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but would it be fair for me to say that the, the books that were written at that time by those particular authors was the propaganda machine for, for, the, for the Crusades? That's true. That, you're, you're absolutely right. Church had its main role in that. I, I can give you a concrete example. There have been 15 English translations, complete, complete English translations of the Quran by the Western scholars. One of them is a Jew, another 14 Christian, and of those 14 Christians, 10, at least 10, they are church officials. It is not a coincidence, it is not a matter of chance. It is George Sale, whose translation was reprinted 250 times. Look, he wrote it in 1734. And in 1734, 18th century, leadership was very limited. And this sales translation of the Quran was, has been reprinted 250 times in USA, mostly in USA and then in English, in England and translated into various European languages. Who was George Sale? He was the president of the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge. His main job was translating the Bible into Arabic in order to lure, attract Muslims to Christianity. Uh -huh. And as part of the same project, he translated the Quran. But once he translates the Quran, all this distortion, mischief is there. To give you just one example, at three or four places, the word up is used of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Suwana Lazi Abdana Ab. So literally, yes, Ab means slave, but how he mistranslates it? Islam was confined to some slaves who had accepted Islam, so that's why the Quran uses this word. Yayonas, mm. Yayonas, always translated as O oh, people of Makkah, what does that mean? That as if Islam is something local for Makkah people, forget about mankind, forget yeah. about non-Arabs, <clears throat> only for, and, and here is somebody who is in, how can a translator of Bible into Arabic, how can he commit this mistake of translating Annas as people of Makkah, something intentional. intentionally. Yeah. You, are, you are absolutely right that it was a concerted effort. And at that time, church, now, uh, uh, don't think of today's church, uh, whether of Canterbury or Catholic church or Protestant church. At that time, church was all powerful, isn't it? Even up to 14th century, uh, before the formation of the Renaissance. Yeah. And the political authority, political authority also rested with church, so church played a very important role in 
Islam bashing. Yes, and uh, Professor Zul, I, I noticed something in chapter number one um, on how it, some people drew the image of the Prophet Sallam as being some kind of an idol that was worshipped as a god. Uh, I found yes, that yes. I found that very strange. Very strange. That is that is the height of it. You can find fault with anything, and with Islam also, you can find something. But to say that uh, they treated the Prophet as God or worshipped him as an idol. That is the height of uh, ignorance, isn't it? That is the height of this much is to some extent you can make, you can give allowance that many of them, they have called him an arc heretic. That essentially, initially he was a Christian. He wanted to reach the high positions, which he could not get. So uh, in revenge, he invented his own and he borrowed material from the Bible and produced something which is called as the Quran. So this might make some sense, isn't it? Yeah. But going to this extent of saying that the Prophet is as an idol and that's why Muslims visit Mecca and that they worship him. And uh, brother, I will take just one minute more. Sure. We are talking about medieval period. 12th century, 13th century, 14th century. You can make some allowance for that. Today, in 21st century, a whole school of neo-orientalists are revisionist school is there, headed by Patricia Krohn, Michael Koch, and Drew Ripin. And you know what is their basic thesis? The basic thesis is, you will be, one will, one will think he's crazy, even on hearing that. What is their thesis? That in 8th century, that is 150 years after Prophet's demise, some Arabs got some political power, some money. So just as a new rich person, he wants to have a kind of pedigree or legacy. So in 8th century, they invented someone and called him Muhammad <laughs> They invented something and called it the Quran. They invented, they gathered the local traditions of the Near East and called it Hadith. So for them, there was no Islam, no Sahabi, no Quran, no history, no Badr, no Oath. Everything is figment of imagination. What do you say about this? And this is what is being done at the British universities. It was John Wansbara of the School of Oriental and African Studies, who, who in 1978 proposed this idea for the first time. And today, this is the rage. This is what is called scholarship. Neo Orientalists are revisionist school, isn't it? Professor, they, they sound to be getting more and more desperate. They, they, they sound yeah, like, a, yeah. Yeah, desperation, uh, uh, crazy, cra sheer craziness, <laughs> isn't it? You, you, may, you may find fault with, uh, with the conduct and the character of Muslims or some of the practices. Fine, fair enough. Academic discussions are most welcome. But going to the extent of uh, demolishing even such basic points, that sounds silly. Just uh, uh, this word sums it up. All right. So you are absolutely right that uh, in medieval times they had such serious misconceptions. And, uh, and very interesting that some of them, they demonized the prophet projecting him as the devil, projecting right. him as the antichrist. Antichrist, not in a literal sense that someone opposed to Christ, but someone similar to the Jal, what we, uh, in our religious tradition, we have the Jal, the anti-God forces. So yeah. for that, they have the term Christ. So they spoke of the prophet as antichrist. So at one level, they are demonizing him. At another level, they are idolizing him. So in uh, just uh, blind 
blind opposition, no, no logic, no reason. So sometimes this charge, sometimes that charge. Anyway, character assassination was there. Yeah, and uh, and professor, this character assassination is nothing that's going to stop. It happened in his lifetime, and it will continue to happen. But subhanallah, what surprises me? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's surprising. This one man, uh, b because of him, there are so many books written about him, and yet the people still want to bring more, which shows the Panda is such a strong character that you can't get away with it. True. True. So, check. Exactly. Let me. And the best, but the best. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so if we uh, just move on to chapter number two, and in chapter number yes. two, I find that uh, you know, mashallah, you were very extensive. You know, it's a chronological order of authors going from 1332 right up to 1881 and you listed so many great people in there um, what was the thinking behind that this, this is what uh, i have studied uh, the proper men of letters uh, from 14th century that's what the beginning of english literature up to 2013 the death of nobel laureate doris lessing the lady, the lady novelist from Britain. So, in their literary works, which image of the prophet we find? So, the important thing is, while earlier writers they are just re-echoing, resounding, replicating the, all the misconceptions and misperceptions about the prophet. But Alhamdulillah, this is Sunnatullah that truth somehow makes its way. Truth ultimately prevails. Some of the writers, even in 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, they said, come on, this is too much. How can you dismiss such a great civilization, such a great culture, such a great personality as someone like a devil? Yeah. German. Yeah. German poet Goethe is one telling example. Goethe, he paid a glowing tribute to the Prophet Then Edward Gibbon in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he speaks highly of Islam as its contribution to legacy knowledge. And then we had the most important figure among the literary figures that is of Thomas Carlyle yes. in 1840. In his, book, in his book, Hero and Hero Worship, he affirmed and asserted in, in his lecture in Birmingham in 1840, he refuted for the first time publicly in the presence, literally in the presence of members of parliament and clergy and other public figures, he refuted, he literally tore into pieces the idea of the prophet being imposter. He said, no way. Look at his life, look at his sincerity, look at his commitment. He is to be placed among the category of the heroes. Wow. Look, this is, this is Allah's way. Mm. And no one is forcing Thomas Carlyle in the 19th century. He, he, the truth dawns upon him and he includes hero in the hero he worship. And the same fact accounts for you know all, but I must uh, make mention of that. Michael Hart's The Hundred, the most influential men in history, 1978. Yeah. He is an ordinary, he is not a scholar, he is an ordinary American writer. He's interested in history, he looks around, works hard, and in the preface he says, to my own shock, I discovered that any parameter which I applied, I found the Prophet Muhammad Sallam to be the top among the hundred. Jesus, Prophet Jesus come at fourth rank, and in the second edition he said, I have received hundreds and thousands of letters at that time. Was not uh, so trolling was not there and SMS <laughs> was not there. Yeah. But hundreds of thousands of letters abusing me and uh, uh, heaping on me the choicest abuses for having placed uh, him at uh, among the top.
among hundred and then placing him at the top number one position. He says, "I can't help it. History is history." I am talking of the influential people. Here is a man without any resources. He changes the whole entire course of history. He changes the mindset of women. Look at the question of women. Women were a commodity after husband's death. Sons they became the masters and husbands of their mothers. Look at the repulsive thing. This is what the, the, yeah. they were inherited. Widows, they were inherited by the sons. Yeah. And we know very well about uh, uh, burying the daughters alive. So he said, somebody who has eliminated, extirpated such inhuman practices, he has to be the most influential person in history. And so, uh, uh, could... Professor, on that, j just a question here on that. So you mentioned Thomas Carlyle. What's the motive for someone like Thomas Carlyle to really go against the trend amongst his own people? Why would he do that? Uh, he, there were some writers earlier to him, uh, Henry Stubb what is one of them, who pointed it out that church for its political and its lust for power, they had tried to obstruct Islam. Because it was not just religion, ideology. Church enjoyed so many privileges, especially political power. Yeah. So for that, they tried to discredit Islam. So now let us be honest, church has, is no longer there in the picture. Right. Let us be honest, let us study history objectively. And that's how he reached the conclusion that the prophet is to be placed among the, among the heroes, isn't it? Uh, all sorts of silly things. Shakespeare, uh, what, he, he's a genius, no doubt about it. But how you are carried away, swayed by the local tradition that in one of the plays he says that the prophet had trained a pigeon and uh, he had put some peas in his ear and at his gesture, the pigeon would come, sit on his shoulder, and then he would present this as receiving revelation, the, that pigeon as the angel coming to him and till, uh, passing on the God's word to him. So genius like Shakespeare is uh, misled or carried away by this and propaganda. You, have this you also mentioned the Alexander Pope as well. Yes, Alexander, Alexander Pope. Yes, Alexander Pope, he speaks of this uh, Muslim or Islam, synonymous with ignorance and uh, uh, violence, sexual perversion, and brutality associated with Islam and Muslims. That was the common theme running across all the all the writings there but here and there you find some positive images and uh, thomas carlyle he is to be credited for this since then there has been a qualitative change especially uh, today in the field of cultural studies okay our history let us say there has been a sea change i can list literally dozens of American, British, German authors who are full of praise, giving due credit to the prophet for his achievements. Yeah, and uh, the, the latest example is British theologian Karen Armstrong. She's a professor of theology, uh, the author of this History of God. Her book on the prophet, look, a lady, Christian lady, professor, uh, appearing regularly on British TV, and is speaking so highly of the prophet. So that's how gradually things do change, which is something highly welcome. And then you believe that, yes, truth ultimately prevails.
that's yeah. the best part. And Professor, you mentioned in uh, chapter three of your book, some of these people like Ma uh, Michael Hart, Karen Armstrong, yes. and Matthew Dimock. You mentioned a few people uh, who yes. positively about Islam. Yes, very positive, positive view. Matthew, for example, you mentioned Matthew Dimock. He's a professor of English studies at Sussex University. His book published in 2014, published from Cambridge University Press. And look here, look at the title, Prophet Muhammad in English Culture. Oh. Book published by Cambridge University Press, prefixing the title Prophet before his name, that is something very significant once you recognize him. So that is from imposter to hero. That's my thesis that how they were misled into believing that he was an imposter. Ultimately, they are recognizing, acknowledging him as a hero, as a benefactor of humanity. And uh, to this, uh, I think, interfaith dialogue that has also contributed you and I can contribute through our conduct. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and Professor, uh, would you say that uh, these authors that we've made mention of, would you say uh, that this is genuinely because people want to present the truth, or do you think because now there's just overwhelming evidence to, to know that he exists and that he's a prophet of some sort, whether they accept it or not, that they were forced to adjust their position? They, they have been, in, in effect, forced to adjust their position and uh, because uh, the facts are on that side. So, but that uh, you should give them credit for their integrity, for their uh, fairness, and truth. This, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, people associated with clergy, misinterpreting, distorting the Quran. Here is the latest example. This. Uh, Frederick Quinn, he's also from church background. Okay. He's a professor of history at the University of Utah. And the title of the book is Some of All Heresies. And there he says we were wrong in projecting Islam as a heresy, as a distorted version of Christianity. Islam in its own right is an independent, life giving, life ennobling religion. So, so good to see. William Montgomery Watt, a very reputed historian, uh, at the end of his career, he openly said in the, in the introduction that I do recognize now the prophet as a genuine prophet, isn't it? Uh -huh. So, yes, Alhamdulillah, in 1993 edition of his book, he says that he was a genuine prophet of God. Same is true of John Esposito. Oh, look at this cordial uh, Christian Muslim relations which he has established at the University of Harvard, Georgetown University, Professor John Esposito. Uh, his books uh, on his Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam he has edited, which is throughout positive, and uh, he has given due credit to the Prophet, to Islam. Muslim, their contribution to civilization. So if we tackle them tactfully, if we interact with them, then I think there is there is a chance and there is hope. And uh, but that is the unfortunate part that under the name of Islam, some such acts are being perpetrated, which have taken this bridge building or uh, understanding at least 50 years back or 100 years back yeah yeah okay. so uh, professor before we come to the to the climate of today i'll ask a few questions uh so with regards to literature books um knowing our history how important is it for someone like yourself who's well experienced well educated well read uh, that our youngsters, young Muslims, they go back and read history and read books and understand what's exactly happening in order for them to understand what is going to happen. That's true. So the best, uh, the best way out is, as I was telling you, better human communication, 
more channels of communication. And Alhamdulillah, now the Muslim presence in the West, whether USA or Europe, UK, that is uh, quite substantial. Muslims have established their own institutions, higher education institutions. So if our young uh, Muslim uh, boys and girls, if they develop their critical faculty, first of all, they should be immersed in their own tradition. They should know something about Islam and Sira and the Quran. They should be not just being born Muslim is not enough. Mm. Because we have so many Muslim scholars with Muslim names, Muslim family names, but practically they are just extending and complementing and supplementing the Orientalist agenda, which is very agonizing. But that, that, that's the fact. So first, uh, we should be self-knowledge, we should learn about our own legacy, and then uh, through this critical reading of Western writers, uh, assimilating their met rigorous methodology, participating in their academic activities, they will make, they, they are bound to make a place for themselves. I can cite you one example. Sure. Uh, this people of Indian origin, mostly from Bengal, now there is a fourth generation of Indians in UK. In every department of English in British University, English, uh, this British universities and the Department of English was the last bastion of Anglo Saxon whites. Otherwise, Everywhere the parkies they have controlled, isn't it? From being taxi driver, from being taxi driver to GP, yeah. they are the colored. They are there. At least the Department of English is the or the their last bastion. But uh, what I'm telling you is, in every Department of English, some Chakravarti, some Chattopadhyaya of Indian origin is assistant associate professor. Tomorrow, I will not be surprised if somebody of Indian origin is professor of English at the University of Oxford, at the University of Cambridge. Why is it so? Merit alone. This Chakrapadhyaya got into the department not because of any anything else other than merit, sheer merit. So if you have the merit, if you have the credentials, and forget about it, uh, this message certainly I would like to give. Please forget about this stereotyping. I know Islamophobia, I know prejudice is there, but nothing to beat merit. It was in 2006, with all my fundamentalists, you can see fundamentalist uh, outlook also, I was offered visiting professorship at the School of English in University of Leicester. My own son, five years ago, he went, he studied aerospace engineering. He stood first in first. Yes, Next sir. day, he got a job there. And there are literally so many hundreds of success. He's Brown, he's Abdul, he's Hafiz, isn't it? But since he, he stood first in first in aerospace engineering, he is working with G with G General Electrical Company in England. So merit at the end of the day, merit counts. We yeah. have to be meritorious, competent. If you are, no one can stop you. No one just as we were discussing this Sira, how it was disfigured, discredited. Not all, but at least now there is a realization that they were unfair and they should amend the ways and they should present a better picture of the prophet. Yeah, of this course. Is my, this is my, uh, what you say, with my gray hair, I can say my advice or message. Please don't be entangled into stereotypes. I don't deny, no, every year as a visiting professor, I visit uh, Leicester and I'm there for three months, so I have some first-hand idea of the problems which uh, Muslims have been facing. 
but uh, at the same time you should give due credit to the system there is a system there is recognition of merit there are avenues there are opportunities equal equal opportunities are there which is a great blessing make the best use of it and no one can stop you from that sure. very good well the professor as well, uh, you mentioned uh, okay. in your book as well uh, islamic studies in british universities okay so um, oh, i want to get your opinion yeah. because orientalism and islamic studies in in, in british universities they intertwined uh, what's your what's your thoughts on studying islam at a british university that that was the strong hold uh, of this school of oriental studies in particular the strong hold of uh, this orientalism but again alhamdulillah very positive welcome change now there is a whole association of muslim staff members teaching in british universities and their number is about 40 or 50 50 muslims committed muslims in various British universities who have been teaching Islam and the Quran. At uh, Marfield, Leicester, there is Marfield Institute of Higher Education. Yes. Totally, yes. Or, totally autonomous. Five MAs, MA Islamic Studies, Islamic Economics, Islamic Banking, Muslim Chaplaincy, PhD, total freedom they are affiliated to some british university for degree purposes and there are so many other muslim colleges institutions which are there so now this orientalist uh, fad is is exposed and the best thing is many students from darul uloom background group bari and group bari from there they have been joining british universities and because they are born and brought up in england so they know the local ethos and with this training at a british universities mashallah they have been turning into good scholars of islamic studies which is a highly welcome thing and this is what this is the role model or this is something which we should emulate and uh, so there has been a positive change from that narrow prejudice biased orientalism to a fair assessment of i i will conclude this with with this uh, again example of the english translations of the quran up to 1930 because english was known to very few muslims mm. the old translations available in the market were by these orientalists today in 2020 There are at least 150 complete English translations of the Quran, wow. and 90, 9200 of them are by Muslims. And what Muslims? Again, it is a matter of great satisfaction for me. I have studied English translations of the Quran. They are. I, I give you the names of the three persons. Uh, Mustafa Khattab is uh, Imam of in Canada. He spent his he is an Egyptian, all other background, 20 years in Canada, and mashallah, producing wonderful translations of the Quran. Next is Dr. Zaki Hamad, his Afghan brother. He spent 20 years again in U.S. and his English translation of the Quran. The third one is Tarif Khalidi, Palestinian brother. at the university of uh, princeton he wrote on sira also so look the uh, arabic is their mother tongue so it's no problem of this legacy or background or history all other background is there then for 20 30 years they have been in the west they know the western mindset they know the needs the intellectual needs of of their readers now the readers they are no longer interested in whether to fasten your hand here or here when praying mm-hmm. they are, they would they would like they would like to find out about gender empowerment they would like to find out about what is the quran's 
Quran's uh, say on environment? What does the Quran what does the Quran have to say about this LBGT LBGT phenomenon? Isn't it about yes. this about this issue of peaceful coexistence? Can we celebrate Christmas with our uh, Christian neighbor or not? Isn't it? Yes. These are the these are the burning issues of the day, and they being having lived in the West first hand, they know the mindset, they know the psyche of both the local Muslims, persons like you, as well as the Islamic position. So they are the best interpreters of the Quran and so Alhamdulillah. Now, uh, and, and uh, because of their years long stay in England, they have gained mastery over English idiom as well. So presentation wise also their presentations are very good. So now the days are over when the Orientalists had their monopoly over English translation of the Quran. Now it is Muslim scholarship that has been flourishing. And I will just, uh, I can't stop telling you. Uh, in 1956, Penguin published a translation of the Quran. Yes. The name of the translator is N.J. Daoud. N.J. Daoud. Okay. I go to uh, Harrods and any bookstore in London, the Quran translated by N.J. Dawood. Naturally, I will pick it up. Uh, you know, his full name is Nesim Joseph David, an Iraqi Jew. Okay. And full of venom against Islam and the Prophet. Mm. Uh, Raked up the issue of Banu Quraiza, Banu Nazir. Yeah. Um, how the prophet uh, expelled them and beheaded them. And so that's how Muslims were befooled. They were, uh, big, uh, they were fraud. A fraud was committed to them. Daud is such a Muslim sounding name. So, and Penguin book appearing to be very credible, isn't it? And yes. Low price, low price as well. Yes. So you uh, uh, pick up the pocket size edition. <laughs> But uh, it is poison. It is poison which is uh, which you which you are getting. Okay. So, so, Professor, I can see you are uh, strongly encouraging uh, the youngsters and people to, to get involved on an academic so, university. Yes. Um, yes. And both sides, I, I I feel from English literature as well as Islamic studies, we should try our very best to get involved and try our very best to reach the highest levels, even teaching and professors and lecturing. Yes. Am I right? That's true. That's very true. Competence and merit that knows no distinction, isn't it? This yes. is this is what the Prophet Sallallahu's awesome. example is there before us and through his conduct he won over the hearts and minds. So we should also try to emulate that example. And that will be the best tribute to them, isn't it? There's not much point in book burning or history protest or uh, expressing frustration, uh, the best way is your conduct, your counter uh, counter writings, they will have the desired effect. And last thing is, please do take care of the Islamic upbringing of, you, of the youngsters, isn't it? Yes. Otherwise, we'll be lost forever. That, that's important. Very, okay. good. very okay. good. So, Professor, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for giving us your time. And uh, I know you're very, very busy and we've taken time out of your busy schedule. Uh, I want to really tell you how we were honored to have your presence, to have this great book. And I'm sure we're going to discuss with you again on another book, inshallah, if you don't mind. Inshallah. Inshallah. Jawak, jawak Allah. Thank exactly. you very much for giving me this excellent opportunity and for putting across my views, which I frankly did. And I wish you the best. And that is a wonderful initiative, this uh, literary society and developing the academic uh, potentials and their, uh, their academic writing. And uh, uh, the more you do, the better it will be, not individually, but for the entire ummah. That, that is the need of the hour. And that's why I mentioned in particular these three scholars who have been trained in the West and look at the great service which they have done to the cause of Islam. So I wish you the very best. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you very much, uh, Professor. We'll see you inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Alaikum. 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 Ala
uh, we can see here that, you know, the, the, the professor is there, he's leaving. Um, but we can see here, alhamdulillah, we had a great interview. And there's so much to benefit from this, so many points of benefit we can take. But I just want to summarize and wrap things up. And one of the key things that stood out with what the professor said was the issue of merit. Uh, and that's very important that here, alhamdulillah, in the West, we have ample opportunity uh, to really learn and to excel. Everybody has the same playing ground. We can all achieve everything equally. There is nothing restricting us. So if we really want to take control of the narrative and really take control of what is said about our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, then firstly we have to stop being passive, sitting at home and criticizing. We have to become active and take some control over what is happening. And the only way we could do that, like the doctor said or the professor said, is by getting involved, by writing, by reading, by going to university, by becoming professors, becoming lecturers. Look, subhanAllah, I say this from the depth of my heart, that subhanAllah, the professor is from India. And he has mastered the English language and he has come and he is lecturing us. We are born and bred in this country and he is lecturing us. And I subhanAllah, I'm saying this again with all humbleness that when I was reading through the professor's book, I had to stop so many times and get a dictionary and understand what is it that the professor was saying because of the level of the language was so powerful. When you reach these levels, then people appreciate and understand who and what you are. And we are a people of knowledge. We are the Prophet Muhammad he said, Talibu ilm farida ala kulli Muslim. Every Muslim is obliged to learn, obliged to study. Likewise, the Prophet said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, An Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. That the Prophet is more important to us than ourselves. How are we going to defend him? If somebody criticizes him, that's their nature. They will do that. It's been done and it will continue to happen. But how are we going to defend the Prophet ﷺ? We have to articulate. We have to represent. We have to behave in the best of ways. So I just want to very briefly, with doctor's permission, hopefully, um, show the cover of the book. Is that okay, doctor? Oh, fine. Oh, fine. Thank you. Okay, so this is, hopefully you can see the screen. So this is the images of the Prophet Muhammad in English literature. And uh, I would strongly recommend everybody watching to get their hands on this book. And you will really, really enjoy it. And it's a journey through history. Um, so now you have a face and you have the book as well. So you know where it is coming from. Uh, on top of that as well, I would like to wrap this interview up by encouraging everyone to go to the Islamic Literacy Society. Here's the website. Um, on the website, you've got book reviews. You've got journals. And here's the video section where this, hopefully this interview will be uploaded onto your catches there. Find a reading club, we we'll sit down together and we read the book together, discuss it in an academic uh, setting. So please do join us. There's so many different books you see there. Uh, you know, some authors that are Muslim, some authors that are not Muslim, but books that we really need to be aware of and educated about. So on that note, I'd like to thank the professor for his time. I'd like to thank all the viewers and those watching as well for their participation. Don't forget to share this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to press the like button and inshallah ta'ala we will see you all uh, very soon on another great interview with another great author like today. Thank you very much. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum.